We learned in the last video the basic concept of a derivative, and we, we learned that the derivative of a function will give you the slope of that function at any given x value or any x value that, that we ask it for. Um, here's the formal definition of a derivative. It's the limit as x delta x approaches 0 for f of x plus delta x minus f of x all divided by delta x. And without going into a lot of detail as to why that gives you the slope at a particular point, just very briefly, um, the f of x plus delta x minus f of x, that gives you the change in height from one point to a later point. And then delta x stands for the change in x. So, so in effect, you have a rise over the run. Now, just this part here without the limit attached to it, that's an approximation to the slope at x. But to make that approximation better, you'll recall that we let the change in x be smaller and smaller, which moves the second dot uh, closer to the, the point in question. And that as that approximation gets better and better, this limit converges to the actual slope, which is what we call the, the derivative. Uh, if you want some more detail on uh, what I was just referring to there, you can watch the previous video. Now, um, we know what the derivative is, but there is a small problem. Uh, actually doing this computation is quite lengthy. I, I did uh, about the simplest example that I could do, and we, we did it for, um, for the function x squared, which is about the simplest curve we can have that's not a straight line. And uh, we learned that the derivative of x squared was 2x. But even the small, simple example was, was somewhat lengthy. And we can quickly tell that if we tried this with um, x to the third or sine x or the square root of x or other types of functions, uh, it's going to get even longer and longer. So what I would love to have is some shorter way to compute the derivative where I don't have to do it using this limit process. And uh, before we get into those details, let me just review some of the notations for derivatives because I didn't put these in the last video. Um, if you're given a function f of x, then the uh, derivative can be expressed as f prime of x. That's, that's the most common notation probably. Um, but obviously not everything has to be written as f of x. For instance, you could say f of x equals sine x or you could say y equals sine x. You could write it as an equation instead of a function per se. Um, so if that's the notation that you're using for the original equation, then we'll use the notation dy dx, and that stands for the derivative of y with respect to x. So change in, in some sense, the change in y over the change in x. In a later video, you'll learn what differentials are and the dy is the differential of y, and the dx is the differential of x. So in some sense, it's the change in y over the change in x. But they mean identically the same thing as f prime. Uh, it's just a different notation. You can also say y prime if, if we choose to. Uh, the last two are, are a little different than the first three. Um, th this notation here looks like dy dx, but there's no y. Uh, this is really what's called an operator, which simply means it's the derivative with respect to x of whatever I'm about to write. So, so for instance, if you said d dx of, as we said earlier in this video, of x squared, that, that's not saying the derivative is x squared. This is saying I'm about to take the derivative of x squared and my answer would be 2x. You know, that's the derivative of x squared. So that's what I what I mean by an operator there. Um, this last notation here is probably the least used of the bunch, uh, but it is used in some upper level classes. We use it for Calc 3 and differential equations. Um, right here, when you put a subscript, uh, capital D with a subscript x, that means I'm about to differentiate with respect to x of a, a particular function. Um, if you progress far enough through the calculus courses and you get to calculus 3, multivariate calculus, then we have what are known as partial derivatives. And so this type of notation would be very helpful um, taking derivatives with respect to not only x, but other functions as well. Um, so anyways, the, the first few are probably the most commonly used. 
We use this notation a lot for physics types of examples when things change with respect to time, you know, maybe miles per hour. So maybe ds dt, you know, it's the change with respect to time, you know, for physics type problems, velocity, acceleration, that sort of thing. Um, but anyways, so let's let's get on with it with the with the rules. These are all shortcuts, and if you memorize enough of these shortcuts, you can do practically any derivative um, infinitely quicker than uh, trying to do the limit definition of derivative. So it's worth the time and effort put into to memorizing these rules here. So here's the first shortcut rule. It's called the constant rule, and all these rules have names. Uh, the constant rule says if you take the derivative with respect to x of any constant any constant, doesn't matter what it is, it, it'll wind up being zero. And there's a good reason for that. Uh, if you had a constant, let's say like y equals 5 or, or something, what would the graph of that look like? It would be a horizontal flat line right here at 5. And then if I turned around and said, what's the slope of this guy at any given x value? Well, you'd obviously say zero. So, you know, it, now, if I change the number 5 to a 7 or a negative 2 or a 3, that's not going to change anything. The slope will still be 0. So that's a shortcut we can use now. We don't have to use the limit definition anymore. If we're ever simply differentiating a constant and only a constant, we can just say 0. All right, next up, we have the constant multiple rule. Uh, it says if you have some constant multiplied times some given function, we can't immediately wipe it out because it's not just a constant, but here's what you can do. If you have 5x squared, for instance, you can take that 5 or whatever the constant may be and pull it outside the derivative and simply differentiate the function alone. So that, that'll make the derivative much easier if you just have to differentiate x squared. So we've already taken the derivative of x squared. So now if we want to extend this to the derivative of 5x squared, well then technically, and I'm writing probably more than I need to here, technically is 5 times the derivative of just the x squared, which would be 2x, and 5 times 2x would give you 10x. Now I will say the more proficient you get at these derivative rules, you can, I normally don't like skipping steps, but you can skip some steps comfortably, for instance, with the constant multiple rule, if you know it's gonna, if this two is gonna come down and become the coefficient, you can go ahead and combine the two and the five and just call it 10x. Uh, you don't actually have to write down every intermediate step, but uh, make sure to write down plenty enough to where your instructor can follow your work. All right, the next rule we use all the time is called the power rule. It's where you have x raised to any given power. Um, to, before I give this rule, let, let's try to guess what the pattern would be. If you had y equals x, just the, the linear function y equals x, that has a slope of 1. It's kind of a 45 degree line. So the derivative would be 1 because that's the slope. Now x squared being a curve will have a, a derivative that depends on x. We did that one in the last video and we got 2x, as I said earlier uh, at, at the beginning of this video. Uh, now for x cubed, we haven't done that one, but I'll just give it to you to help us figure out the pattern. The derivative, if you did it the long way, using limits, you would get 3x squared. 3x squared. So just look at these, and hopefully you can detect a pattern. Um, for instance, I can tell that these powers seem to be moving out front and becoming uh, the new coefficients. So you have x to the first then you have a 1, then a 2 comes down and a 3 comes down, and, and in fact that is that is what, what, the, uh, what the pattern is. Now what about the exponents for x? Well, they go from a 2 to a 1, from a 3 to a 2, and from a 1, in some sense, to a 0. So extending this to a gen general pattern, you'd have n x to the n minus 1. And uh, so that's what we call the, the power rule. And we'll come back and do some simple examples when, after I get through with all these rules here. The sum and difference rule it says if you're taking the derivative of one function plus or minus another function, it doesn't matter which, then we can simply differentiate the first function and take its derivative plus or minus, whatever the case may be, 
the derivative of the second function. That's a, a great, great rule uh, that helps us differentiate things like polynomials where you might have x squared plus 5x minus 7. All you have to do is differentiate the x squared, the 5x, and the 7, and then just combine those individual terms together. Now, a lot of functions require us to rewrite the function before we differentiate because this is extremely important. You can't take a derivative unless it explicitly matches one of the rules. So, for instance, this particular function in no way matches any of the original uh, rules, but if I work on it a little bit, maybe it will. Um, now, notice I'm not differentiating yet. This is still f of x. I'm just rewriting it, just some, some algebra steps here. For instance, I notice I could break that square root apart and say 1 over root 5 times 1 over root x. And then uh, the 1 over root 5 is basically a constant. And then the 1 over root x, uh, that doesn't match any of the rules above. But if I rewrite, re rewrote that as x to the negative 1 half, then it looks like the constant multiple rule along with the power rule. So these rules are able to be mixed and matched as well. So the derivative would be from the power rule, we'll bring this negative 1 half down. So I have negative 1 over 2 root 5 times x to the n minus 1. So what's 1 less than negative 1 half? It would be negative 3 halves. Now, after we differentiate, the last step is we, uh, that we need to do is clean it back up a little bit. So final answer, we'd have 1 over, 1 over 2 root 5 to either times x to the positive 3 halves in the denominator, or you could say the square root of x to the third. That's also x to the 3 halves. So um, either way, you say it's OK. And, uh, and so that's how we differentiate. Uh, you have to rewrite many of these functions, and then um, take the derivative and then simplify it. All right, real quickly, uh, a couple of the trig derivatives. I'll try not to take too long with this. Um, the derivative for sine, rather than just giving it to you, let me quickly uh, go through and explain why it is what it is. Um, if we go through just certain individual key places, we can kind of tell what the slopes will be at certain places. For instance, at zero, it looks like the slope is about 45 degrees, which would be a slope of one. And then later it's 0 at pi over 2 when sine is 1. And then later right here it looks like the slope is negative 1. So I'm just going to plot the slopes as y values. Later the slope is 0. Uh, that's at uh, 3 pi over 2. And then at 2 pi it looks like you have a slope of 1 again. Now if we play connect the dots, this would be a graph of the derivative of sine x, and we should recognize that blue graph. That's the graph of cosine x. So it turns out that the derivative for sine is cosine. And the derivative for cosine, if I go through this real quickly here, kind of look at some slopes, you have a slope of 0, and then negative 1, and then 0, and then positive 1, and then 0 again. And if we play connect the dots, unfortunately, this is not sine x. I really wish it was because that would be a nice relationship. Derivative of sine would be cosine, and the derivative for cosine it would be great if it was sine, but obviously this blue graph is not sine, but it looks very close to sine. Notice it is sine x, except it's inverted. It's reflected across the x-axis. So the actual derivative for cosine would be negative sine. Now, there are other trig derivatives for tangent, secant, cosecant, and, uh, and cotangent, um, and we'll cover those in a later video. Uh, now, what, all I wanted to cover in this video was the basic derivative rules. We still can't differentiate everything. For instance, if there was a product, we don't have a rule for that yet. Quotients, composition, where, where you have layers, maybe the sine, not of x, but the sine of 5x plus 1. We can't differentiate that yet. Exponential functions and logarithms, those rules will come, will come later. All we're covering in this video 
is what you would call the basic derivative rules. So um, if you watch the later videos, we'll cover some of these, and I'll also post some videos on some tougher examples using these basic, basic derivative rules.